today's guest is an actress, singer, dancer, director, writer, producer, and all around incredible human being. Please welcome to the Zoom, Matisha Baldwin. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am wonderful. I'm so happy that you're doing this. Thank you. Well, thanks for asking me. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, so on Behind the Resume, we always start by talking about how we met. I have known you for seven years, right? I feel like it's been longer, but yeah, you're so young. So seven <laughs> years is probably, probably long enough. <laughs> I remember I auditioned for the It Factor Performing Arts Troupe uh -huh. with Tara Bennett Smith. How did that concept start, actually? I had a theater academy called the It Factor Theater Academy um, in Burbank. Probably a year into me having the academy, I was putting on productions with kids, writing original musicals, and kids were getting nominated for Young Artist Awards and all these things. And then they said, hey, can your kids come and perform at all these different mm -hmm. events? And my students couldn't necessarily. So I was like, well, I should have auditions just for a troupe mm -hmm. that would go around and perform. Mm -hmm. And so I called uh, one of my oldest friends and who's now a current producing partner, Tara Bennett Smith. And I said, you want to join in on this with me because I can't run the studio, do my own career and yeah. the troupe at the same time. And that's how it happened. And it factor performance troupe started and we started <laughs> doing yeah. little shows everywhere. I will never forget getting the call that I got in. I was like, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget meeting you and your mother for the first time. You were like this bubbly ray of sunshine. And <laughs> it was undeniable. You were smiling from ear to ear. You had so much energy and you came in and you sang for me and like, tap danced and you, you like, I was like, okay, she's gonna be in something. I don't know what we're gonna do. I was like, but we definitely have to have her because she's going to light up the stage. Oh, <laughs> You caught my attention. Oh, loved you. You had great energy and personality and that whatever you throw at me, I'm going to do my best spirit. And I was like, that's what we want. We want oh people my gosh. doing this. Well, it was so much fun because we performed at the opening of a teen film festival. Mm -hmm. And we did the pilot of Cake Built Sweets. Yes. We sang at a cake show reality show pilot and they were making all the cakes and then between between like scenes we just started singing because it was like you know when you go to old school tv show tv they'd have the comedian right they'd have yes. people you know and so it's like well let's have performers <laughs> i think we only did like three or four performances and then we wind up having to disband everything yeah i can't remember why at the time i think i i booked something and then i i don't know but <laughs> Yeah. It was unfortunate that we couldn't keep going. It was my first LA audition, and so it was such a wonderful introduction to the industry for me, getting to work with you and Tara, and just like good, nice people, because you don't always find that. And so I'm really grateful that that was my first experience. You know, that makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to ask you questions and pretend like I don't know the answer. Um, okay. Like, where are you from? I'm from Chicago, Illinois. No. <laughs> and how many cousins do you have? <laughs> I have 38 first cousins on my dad's side alone. Okay, okay, because you said 50 the last time. No, I mean, probably inclusive. We talk <laughs> I was like, did something Andrew. happen that I didn't know? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, I have 38 first cousins on my dad's side alone that's in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they are like my brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest of all 38. But by like months, not like, you know, we're all... <laughs> But yeah, they were my brothers and sisters. I love my massive, crazy, crazy family. <laughs> that is awesome. How did you get into performing? I was a tour baby. So my parents were singers, entertainers. My dad used to tour and play trombone and sing with the emotions. And he was on tour with like, I think Brothers Johnson and Earth, Wind and Fire, Commodores, all of them. And so I know that there's pictures out there of me as a baby on airplanes, tour planes with all the band guys and the people from all these huge groups that you'd see, you know, that maybe you don't even know out holding me and things, things like that. That's how I got the bug. I watched my parents sing and perform and on stage live. When Do I you remember there. that? 
I remember rehearsals is uh-huh. what I remember. I'm sorry. I never got to see the shows that I remember because, mm-hmm. you know, I was little and I remember being in hotel rooms, like where my mom would go. Wow. Um, she, they tuck me in the bed and I'd have all the food and the TV. Oh, and um, she goes, don't leave the room. Don't, if anybody knocks, don't answer. I'll be right downstairs. And how old were you? Two years old? And you're like. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> <Hi>, mom. <laughs> It was a di- I, it was a different time back then. Like you, I'm I'm older than you, so it was different back then. And I think like watching her dress up and go put on her sequins and her outfits, and she'd go. I knew she was singing, and I just knew what they did in rehearsals. And I just sit in the bed and watch TV, and I'm like, that's what, I want to be on the TV because that's what I how I'd entertain myself while I was waiting for her to come back or I'd go to sleep or whatever. So there wasn't even anything else that was a thought like this was just what you were doing yeah I mean I'm good at a lot of things I can do obviously I'm a business owner and all these things I never wanted to do anything else ever so when you were really little what was the dream was it Broadway acting acting on tv because that's what I watch in the hotels all day Uh and I I think I didn't want to sing because my parents did it and I was like yeah you you do that that's your thing I don't want to I don't want to sing. I'm going to act. I'm going to be on TV. But again, there was nobody on TV that looked like me. So for me, it was, I, I don't know. And I, I, I don't think I felt like I couldn't do it. But growing, when I grew older, I, I had a different understanding of it. But I was like, that's what I want to do. I didn't know how I was going to get there. I just knew that someday I was going to get there. <laughs> Who were your role models growing up? They were all singers because cause that was the... But like Janet Jackson was huge for me because she was one of the only people I saw who was acting. And then when she got older and she released control and she was singing and she was dancing and I was like, oh, I can do all three because look at Janet Jackson, you know, um, she, she did it. And so I was watching her. And so she was huge for me. Like she would do every award show and I would learn all the choreography and like, you know, record on VHS, <laughs> which is, I'm aging myself again, record on VHS and, and just play it over and like kill my tapes, like just copying her because there wasn't a dance class that you could go to back then. There was, there, there just, it wasn't like it is today for you. So mm-hmm. you wanted to do something, you really had to pave your own way and envision yourself there and figure it out. So Janet was huge for me, I if think. If you could tell her one thing, what would you say? I probably wouldn't be able to speak if I... <laughs> <laughs> one person. No, I, I think I would just say thank you, mostly. Just, um, just for being herself. She had, The track she had with her family being who they were, she made her own way, her own name. She was... Janet separate of the Jacksons you know what I mean and so she didn't let anybody put her in a box and that's what her whole album was about at the time that it was you know it was about being in control and I and I liked that and I felt and so I would say thank you to her for putting that message out because that was important for little black girls at the time little girls in general but especially for little black girls you know so I would say thank you yeah. Isn't that so beautiful? Thank you for being you. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> How would you describe yourself as a kid? I was a really good kid. I did everything I was told all the time. Yeah. Uh, but I was a happy, happy kid. We didn't have money, but I didn't know that. And that's hard to say saying that my parents were on tour. But again, the music industry, you know, you didn't, you toured, but you know, everybody took money from artists. And so it was a whole different time. So we weren't poor, but half of my family's in the projects in Chicago, but I had such a big family. So I just was so happy being around all those people all the time and getting to see things that um, a normal kid wouldn't see go from being on a huge tour, going home to being stacked on top of 38 cousins, you know, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like I got the best of of family and the best of, of, of work and knowing business and, and what that was like. Um, so I was just, I was happy. If yeah. your 10 year old self saw you now, what would she say? I think my 10 year old self 
would say um, probably want me to be more like my 10 year old self. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I think most people would maybe switch that around and say like, <clears throat> if I knew then what I knew now, mm -hmm. but I feel like my 10 year old self was less jaded. My 10 year old self didn't have the weight of the world that I have now and, and what I've seen and what I've been through nothing could stop my 10 year old self in my mind. Mm. Like I could do anything that I wanted to do, be anything, show up anywhere, walk through any door, not be ashamed, not be embarrassed, um, not be hesitant, have fear. Yeah. Like, none of that existed when I was 10. I miss her. I miss that 10 year old, that, that side of myself yeah. that I sometimes wish I had back that fearlessness, that carefreeness, that, that weightlessness that I had at 10, there was a sense of, of security there that I think I, I miss a little bit. We've talked about the artist's way, right? Yes, we have. Because I think that book is kind of all about getting back to your inner child and younger self and um, how beautiful. So you wish you n knew, you wish you, I'm trying, like not you wish you knew right. that what you know now, you wish you knew now, I don't know, but I get the point. <laughs> Hard to, it's hard to put it into words. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you're young, you just, you believe mm -hmm. you have imagination. You, I mean, as artists, we have to have that anyway, but it can get chipped away bit by bit as yeah. you go through things. And when you're younger, I don't think it's chipped at yet. So how do you maintain that along your journey? People that I, I surround myself with great people. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I teach mm. because I, <clears throat> I always say, I wish I had a me when I was mm. a teenager and coming up and trying to learn. And so giving helps me to put things into perspective for myself mm. and yeah. realize all the things that I've done that allows me to be able to give my experience to other people, my core group of people, my family, for sure, that I can always talk to. I'm from Chicago. So when I go home, it's like, it's, yeah, like it's therapy. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. You know, I have so much fun. So that, that's what keeps me going. Yeah. Honestly. What were your teen years like? My mother was changing careers. So she was going to law school mm. and I was going to high school. So we were in school together. I had to be very independent because law school is, is, is a lot. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of, um, you know, let me cook you dinner. Let me this, let me that, you know, yeah. I was in cheerleading track, <laughs> like, yeah. acting class. I was doing everything. I gotten myself an agent. It was like, if you want to go to auditions, you better learn how to take the bus or you better figure out how to get your driver's license as soon as possible and drive yourself. Like it, it was, if you're going to do it, you have to do it because I have to go to law school. Mm. And I respected that and understood that because it was like, I, so I've watched my mom work hard. And yeah. so it made me work hard, you know, I mean, but that was my whole life. So my teen years was really about getting to college for me because in Chicago, there just wasn't anything offered in entertainment. Mm -hmm. I gotten myself, I had three agents at the time in Chicago. Wow. You could have multiple agents. Um, and there just were no auditions there. Now there is, but there was nothing. And I remember the only biggest audition I ever got in Chicago was for Dangerous Minds with Michelle Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. And I remember they cast like a 30 year old as the high school role that I, and I was like, what, <laughs> you know? And, and they were like, but we really liked you and you were amazing and this, and, and that was it. There was no other, I would do commercials. Mm -hmm. um, while I was in Chicago and that's how I got my union card. So that's all I could do was just commercials, industrials, so that I could prepare myself to get to LA. That was my high school years. What do I need to do? And the second I graduate, I'm leaving Chicago so I can live my dream as an actress. So that was my goal was just to learn, be in as many classes and musicals that I could um, soak myself into just so I could be a student so that I was prepared when I got here. Yeah, did you want to go to college? I didn't, I, I wanted to just come and work, but my parents were like, hey, it's California, it's really far, and if we're gonna help pay for this, you have to go to school. 
Mm-hmm. So I made sure that I got into one of the best schools at the time, um, Loyola Marymount University. And they were listed on in the list at the time as one of the top 10 film schools in the US. Wow. And Loyola, I, I, I auditioned for Juilliard, Loyola, DePaul, Northwestern. Those were my schools. And I got a full ride to DePaul, got into Northwestern and, oh, and USC. But what Loyola did to recruit me was, I guess they didn't have many people of color or they didn't have anybody of color in their theater department, not one. Wow. So the Black Student Union heard that I was applying and was like, they went around, they knew I couldn't come to California and they had somebody from the Black Student Union go videotape the campus for me and mail it to me. Oh and I get this thing in my mail, this video. And they're like, we, here's why you need to come to Loyola. We need more diversity. We need this, we need that. And that's why I picked Loyola. Wow. Yeah. Oh my God. Did you have a positive experience there? Loved it. If I was gonna owe student loans and... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, and spend out of state fees and really, you know, and not take that scholarship that I had to DePaul. Um, I, it had to be worth it for me. And the classes at the time were like 10, maximum 10 people a class. Oh, yeah. When we learned Shakespeare, they flew people in from the Royal, from London, from the Royal Shakespeare Academy to teach us out of first folio. Wow. That's incredible. All of our teachers were working in the business. One of my teachers was reoccurring on Frasier so we get to go to TV tapings we oh, get to fun. hear it like things that I just don't think I would have ever gotten going anywhere else mm-hmm. so I really got to be hands-on and really learn the craft um and I I I wouldn't trade that but you were hustling outside of school too at the same time oh yeah I was working like three jobs I was teaching dance and i would gotten an agent so I was auditioning wherever I can. I figured, let me get myself in some of these musicals. So at the time it was the Civic Light Opera of the South Bay Cities that was here. And so I went to South Bay Cities and I was like, I'm gonna get into these musicals and start working. And on the side audition for TV film or commercials or whatever it was. And that's what I was doing. And that's how I was performing, rehearsing. I start class at eight o'clock in the morning so that I could be done by 11 or 12 and then go to rehearsals, go teach class so I can make extra money. I worked in financial aid office so that I know how to get more financial aid for wow. work study and get like, I, I was 24 hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> so when did you do dream girls? I did dream girls when I was in college. So I was, it was, I think it was my sophomore year. I think wow. it was. And I went to South Bay. I had done a show for them the year before and they were like, we're finally going to do an ethnic show and they had never done one before wow. um and dream girls was it uh-huh. and i thought they called me because you know they didn't have unfortunately at the time they didn't really have too many people of ethnicity in their shows because they weren't doing shows and you know you think theater is is blind casted you know mm-hmm. now yeah it is <laughs> but even back then you know um i remember doing a show and I was the only person of ethnicity. They said I stood out too much and they would have the other girls come 30 call time, 30 minutes before me so they can put Tanner on them. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. And I will, oh my I at least will remain nameless, but um, yeah. oh my, my, fir- my first, my first musical in LA that happened. And I kept going, well, why is everybody else's call time 30 minutes before mine? And I just happened to come early one day and they were putting like Tanner on the girls. And I was like, what is happening? Why are you making like them darker? And I just thought these, you know, <laughs> I just didn't know. And they're like, well, you stand out on stage. And I'm like, well, isn't that a good thing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I still, I mean, I've had experiences, but still, you know. Um, and then I was like, wow, okay. And what am I gonna say? I. I can't say anything, but I'm the only person of color in a show where they should have people of color in the show because of the t- show. I would yeah. say what the show is, <laughs> but um, so so needless to say, a year later, I get a call. Um, can you audition for Dreamgirls? Although you've already worked work 
you know, with our company, our people in our company. I said, sure. And I go and I audition and I get in and it was me and one other girl with the two youngest people there. And when I walked into rehearsal, it was like, I just was, I couldn't believe I was there because I was yeah. like, you on my CD and I saw you on Broadway. And, yeah. and I called my mom and they did step into the bad side. And after I watched them do that number, I started crying. I just couldn't contain myself because that was the first time that I had ever, number one, been in a room, in a performance room with all people who looked like me. Like I never, and here I am 18, 19 years old and wow. never had that experience. Yeah. And they were, and I was like, I watched it a little bit here and there. I've heard about this and the harmonies and the, and it just the energy in the room and everybody was so excited and grateful to be there. And that this show that nobody ever does that they're doing. Yeah. And this wasn't the Dream Girls revival that you see now. This was the original. So we had the original understudies. We had the original um, choreographers, like who were under Michael Bennett, like Robert Clater, like um, Billy Porter was in my cast. I love Billy like, Porter. <laughs> Ron Kellum. I mean, just the people that were in my cast. I just, Keisha, I, I, I can name every, I just was like, I just can't, that experience that I had, I, it was once in a lifetime. So was that experience really affirming? I'm sure for in so many ways. Yes. Um, it scared the mess out of me. <laughs> because it, it made it made me like I said, I kind of was like, how did I get here? Like, I always knew it was what I wanted to do. But doing it and being there is a whole other thing and believing that you are good enough yeah. to actually be there, even though you're there. You know, did you have that like imposter syndrome? Oh yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. I've always had it. Really? It's interesting. Yeah. I have to, there's times when I have to talk myself up, even though I know I can do something and I know I'm good at something. I know I'm capable. I know that I've worked as hard as I can. Yeah. Um, it's just, I'm my own, because I'm, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I'm my own worst critic Yeah. because of anybody else. It's because of the expectation that I put on myself mm -hmm. to be better, which I think is a great thing because mm -hmm. I will, I, I always want to be the best I can be, but it, but it can also be because you're in an industry that rejects you all the time. Right. <laughs> you have to be kind to yourself. Yeah. Well, and I'm so sure I'm everyone that. watching this can relate to that. What is your advice to not let that hurt you I think you have to be realistic and I think that what, what I try to tell my students is that as long as you're doing the best that you're capable of in the moment mm -hmm. that's all you can ask for that there is no even though I say I'm a perfectionist there is no such thing as perfection mm -hmm. that you can't strive for perfection you have to you have to strive for the best that you can be the best that you can do but that comes with preparation that mm -hmm. comes you know with um spending the time to really work on your craft. And if you haven't spent that time and that effort and then you fail, okay, then you might need to <laughs> talk to yourself. But if you spent that time and that effort and you've really put your all into it, then you can't beat yourself up about it. Yeah. And then you just work to do the next thing even better, right? And take this opportunity for what it is. So I think living in the moment helps with that. Um, cause sometimes we can get so caught up in where we want to be with this as a, and then really sitting in, what did you just do? Do you realize what you just did? Because other people saw it, but you didn't, right. you didn't enjoy any of that. And people went, oh, and they got something from it. And you just are sitting there downing yourself and you didn't receive from it. So, so learn to receive from your own experiences and take them in and be truly in that moment. Cause you will never get that moment back. Yeah. That's what you just told me at Shrek. <laughs> yeah. And I, I live by that. I've had to learn how to live by that because it'll pass you by and then you'll, and then you'll go, Oh man. It, it's like when, when cast get together, you hear people talk about it was a once in a lifetime experience. Can you imagine going through something like that and not really experiencing it and not having enjoyed it when you were there and then looking back on it go, yeah, I guess it was when they say hindsight is everything. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, forget about hindsight, be in it. <laughs> yeah. When did you get the feeder bug? Um, I think when, I don't quite remember. I think because I was, when I was telling my parents when I was like three that I wanted to act and because they were singers, they were like, well, you can do musical theater because you can sing, dance and act. Because it was also too, my parents were like, well, there's not really acting roles. There's not, you know, being in Chicago. So their thought was, well, if you're going to be in entertainment, you better learn how to do all three. Because mm -hmm. if you want to work, there might not be work here in this field, in this particular thing. So I think I credit my parents for that. And then I did a school production of like, I don't know, I have a little picture of me doing something, Cinderella, I was a maiden. I, I don't, I, I've seen the costumes. And then I remember in fifth grade, I got to do Oliver. Mm. And I got to play the artful Dodger uh -huh. of all the roles double as a milkmaid <laughs> and playing Dodger was like oh sh this little girl casts a boy because I was the only person who could sing that high that's probably why I got it um and I think that really made me love theater because mm. I got to be so different than who I am in fifth grade you know yeah you yeah know, I, had to, I had to I'm like I got to learn a British accent I got to, <laughs> to yeah. be a boy. And I mean, there were so many things I got to do at that age that I just didn't think. And I was like, oh, this is what this world can be. I can, I can, I can really transform into a lot of things and not have to be on TV to do it. Yeah. What would you say is your why for being an artist? My why is that first and foremost, it is my passion. Mm -hmm. And I want to make people feel how I feel when I watch yeah. other things. Yeah. Um, when I see things that are life changing for me and how they impact me emotionally and how they make a difference in my life, just like how Janet made a difference in my life, that's, that's the kind of projects that I want to be involved in. What are some shows that have done that for you? Movies. Um, Let's, let's go down the gamut. Musicals, obviously. Dream Girls was one of them. But the original Dream Girls, nothing against the revival. <laughs> the original Dream Girls was one of them, not because I was just, I was in it, but it also made me appreciate um, time periods. It made me appreciate uh, uh, the music of that time and understanding, getting outside of my parents, you know, music and going oh this is other people doing music let me pay attention because i wanted i didn't want to have anything to do with music because of my parents so it really opened opened my heart up to music and sounds and things wow. like that um dance wise i remember there was a show hubbard street dance in chicago they are one of my favorite dance companies and when i was younger um i would take dance classes from teachers at Hubbard Street. And I would take tap classes with people like Savion and we were young together, but he was, he was at my, at Sammy Dyer Dance Academy. And watching Hubbard Street, the type of shows that they would put on to move people, they found a way, like they would have live um, celloists on stage. Um, wow, cool. And, and uh, live uh, harpist and they would do just these moving pieces that told a story, but whatever they were telling, whether it was about, um, you know, violence or people's rights or just a coming of age story, whatever it was, the whole point was to get you from beginning to end to make you leave there thinking about something that you didn't think about before. So as far as live, uh, Dream Girls did that, Hubbard Street Dance did that for me movies uh one of my favorite movies is braveheart is what and braveheart oh <laughs> but one of my other favorite movies is this movie called um it's called imitations of love hmm. the remake though it is a movie uh about a black woman who was a maid and she had a baby um by a white male so the baby was biracial but she could pass for white and the little girl decided as she got older that she wanted to to pass for white and she would deny her mother and treat her like the maid on the side and the white family that they worked for 
would, would raise her and do all these things. And finally, when she decided to accept her mother into her life, her mother dies. And I remember watching that movie when I was younger and I was like, why would she deny her mother? Because, you know, and all these things, but I understood that she wanted something better for herself and she could only get there by a certain way. And if people knew she was black, she, she felt she couldn't get there. And so movies like that, that are just, it doesn't necessarily have to be about racial conflict, but anything that is causing growth, causing thought provoking, um, anything like that, I really gravitate to. So Imitations of Life mm. was always one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Um, real old school, I guess, type of things. <laughs> what recent movie that's come out would you have loved to have been a part of? What movies have I, I, I that's, the, that's the thing, I haven't seen any movies. I've been so busy these last couple of You've been years. making movies, you've been busy. <laughs> I, yeah, I know, so I haven't seen anything. Um, that's a good question that I wish I could answer. <laughs> That's really bad because there's tons of movies. I just can't think of any of them at the moment because I haven't seen all the new ones that I want to see so bad. I did see, okay, I'll say this. I did just watch Elvis two nights ago, finally, with my mom. We rented it. Baz Luhrmann is just amazing to me. So anything Baz Luhrmann, I want to be a part of. And what I appreciate about him is that he really tries to get into the history of things. When he, when he does tell a story, he does his research and he brings it to life in such a colorful and inventive way. Yeah. And sometimes he's not always telling the typical story that you would expect. I really appreciate that about Baz. So probably anything that he's done, I would say, yeah, put me in it. Yeah. What advice would you give to aspiring actors or someone who's just getting started in the industry? I would say that if you can see yourself doing something else, do it. <laughs> You're saying quit now. <laughs> okay. I don't mean it that way. I, I mean, because it's not, it's not about, I think a lot of people want the fame because yeah. we're, we're in a society now of instant gratification. Mm -hmm with the internet and with everything. If you wanna be a true artist, it will never be about instant gratification for you. It will be a constant working journey. If you can see yourself doing something else, then you don't really want this. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's kind of what I mean by that. Um, yeah. Then do that other thing because the things that we have to go through it's not worth it to put yourself through some of these things yeah. if you can go be happy um, starting your own business or working for a tech company or something like that. Or I like cooking, you know, and I might want to be a chef. Uh, those things are wonderful too. But if this is your true, true passion and you have to do this because it's what feeds you, it's, it's creating being a storyteller, um, wanting to help people as a storyteller and give back with your stories, if that's what you really want to do, then, then great. But if that's not why you're here, then, you know, do take a little class for fun and, you know, do, yeah. do some other things. Um, but we are storytellers is what we are. So you, you have to be conscious of what you're putting out there and, and really want to to tell the right story. But if this is your purpose in life, for someone starting their career, what would you advise? Surround yourself with the right people. Be careful of, um, because you're always gonna have, and go with your, you have to know what you really want. And don't be afraid to stand up for that. Don't be afraid to stick to that. Don't let anybody tell you well, if you don't do this or do it this way or be willing to compromise on certain things, then you're not going to make it. Um, it needs to be about how you go through the door and you need to be happy with that. Not when you go through the door, not how fast you go through the door, not who you're going through the door with, <laughs> you know? So I would just say, you know, know what you want, know, figure out who you are as you're growing and be proud of that. And don't let anybody tell you that it's not okay. That, 
I think that's what I would say. And yeah. Work hard. I mean, work hard. Put all you got into it. Yeah. Along your journey um, of just being an artist and all the things that you do, how do you manage redirections and roadblocks and when things just don't work out the way that you were expecting them to? I think that's just kind of life in general. Yeah. So I feel like if I treat it like this is not anything different, mm -hmm. I think a lot of artists tend to make this entertain forget that this is a business yeah and they make it life mm -hmm. but this is a business it's not your life and life does have roadblocks and in business business has a a certain structure to it and a certain um um there's reasons that you get to the next step at a job or things you have to do to get there or you may not get this promotion or someone unfairly gets it over you there's it's a business. And so when you realize this is a business and my life is over here, and even in my life, if there's something that I want, then how do I then tackle and make this business work for me? Mm -hmm. And so it may not look like it looks for someone else and that's okay. And don't have that expectation that it needs to look a certain way. Your expectation is, is that it needs to be what it is. And then how can you make it better? What yeah. can you do to do go around that and add what you need to it to fulfill you. What's been the happiest moment of your career? Probably when I produced my own project. I just produced my first, um, I produce other people's features, but I just produced my first feature film and I wrote it, I produced it, I co-directed it. And I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic allowed me to slow down and gave me the time to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And that was most fulfilling. It was something that I wanted to say, something that I hadn't seen. Um, and it was with people that I got to choose. Yeah. It, I, it was done in a way that that even the environment on set and the energy and certain things, I got to put that together and create what I wanted to create, not just what you see on camera, but behind the set too, and create those relationships and bonds. Because it's just, it's not always about what, what you do on camera. It's what you do behind the scenes, because these are the people that you're going to be working with and you, and you hope to create a, an experience with them that that resonates for the rest of your life and changes yeah. you changes them and so I think that for me that was the highlight just doing it for myself not having to wait on anybody else and working that hard was a lot it was a lot of work to do all of that but I felt the most accomplishment mm -hmm. I could go shoot a feature film with someone else and be the lead in it and I didn't feel as accomplished as I felt doing it on my own yeah. Where do you hope to see yourself in 10 years? 10 years, I hope to really have my production company uh, really soaring and produce it, putting people like you, you know, people that I know, my old students, and really just putting people who I know are so talented and who really give back to the community and finding ways to continue to do that. My ultimate dream would be able to take all the money uh, from my the production company that I have and be able to give back even more into the homeless situation that we have, uh, train uh, homeless people and have a program where we're training them to even be crew members, to wow. give jobs, to do things cool. like that. Um, I have a business plan that is like that, that I've been sort of circling around um, and working on adding to the production company that I have now. So that is the goal is to get my production company to a place where I can have that separate educational facility that not only gets people off the streets, or I know people do it with incarcerated people, but we have so many people out here that are in need of jobs. Um, and so I want to be able to just give back even more. So that is my goal and where I'd like my company to go in the future. That's beautiful. I didn't know that. Thank you. I love it. Um, <laughs> and then I love ending on this question. What do you want your legacy to be?
don't know that I think I just that I was just a good person. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. I just I try to be the best person I can be. Really, I, I want people to be like, she was a good person. She was she really, you know, because I, I believe that that's that that's what I'm here for. I believe that that's why God placed me here, that that's why I even do entertainment. And I think maybe being a good person might sound so general, but being good to others, being good to myself, um, in no matter what I'm doing, I want, I always want the environment to be that she had integrity mm -hmm. and that she was a good person. And I, I think it's just that simple. Who, okay, one more question, actually. <laughs> Who are the people in your life that lead by that example? My mom, for sure. Um, she, she's an attorney. I watch her, I've watched her all my life really like, she's everything that I, everything that I am is because of her. I have to say, she is the one who has been by my side for anything and everything. And in her job as an attorney, she hates to talk about it, but she's, she's got awards and she's changed laws and huge things um, as a divorce attorney because she fights um, for men's rights and men to have you know rights with their children and certain things. And just watching the difference that she makes in people's lives. And you think divorce attorney, how could you be making a difference? But really what she's doing is trying to say that there are good parents out there, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And there are good people, even though they're getting divorced, it doesn't have to always be this terrible fight and battle. And how do we keep the kids out of the middle? Yeah. And so watching her try to even reason with certain clients and how she talks to people and how she deals in court she always makes sure that like judges when they know her by name judges will refer her wow. to clients because of how she presents herself how she takes care of her clients even you know even even the opposing counsel will be like wow that woman when she walks through the door, you know she means business. You know she's a great attorney, but you also know she's a woman of character. That she's a woman who's going to care for you. She's not going to, while she's going to state her case and get what she wants, she doesn't have to be mean about it. She doesn't have to be underhanded. She doesn't have to be a bulldog, if that makes sense, like attorneys divorce yeah. get categorized as. So watching her do that and how she made it from nothing in the sticks of Louisiana, uh, to being one of, not one of the top uh, head attorneys as a black woman in Chicago, Illinois, is amazing to me. So directly connected to me, uh, that would be my mother, for sure. Oh, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I feel like I actually did learn. I didn't think there was anything that I didn't know about you. Uh, and I did learn. Yay, I'm so glad there's something you learned. <laughs> Where can everyone um, follow your journey and watch out for future projects and all of that? I'm so bad at social media, but I am on Instagram as Matisha Music. I'm on Facebook as Tish Tish. <laughs> because again, I'm, uh, I think I'm on there as Matisha Music as well, but I don't update it. Um, but mostly uh, Instagram, I think, is the one I'm going to keep up on. Um, I have a, you can watch me on Lifetime. October 1st, the Gabby Petito story is coming out. We should do that in my backyard. You should come over and we could put it on the big screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So that comes out on October 1st. And um, so I'm excited about that. And yeah. And maybe from Julia, maybe Julia will update you on what I'm doing since <laughs> I update my social media. <laughs> yeah. I'll keep everyone updated on Matisha's um, <laughs> projects. I'll be like your PR person. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.